I guess I will get started. Um, thank you for joining me. My name is Emily Bala. I am the mental health lead uh, at the district. And I am very excited to be here tonight to talk to you about that transition to high school. I think it is such an important time for kids to be talking about uh, the many feelings that I'm guessing that they are feeling and perhaps you are feeling. Uh, for some, I know that it is exciting. For some, it is nerve wracking. And for others, there might be a bit of ambivalence. I also have a grade eight that is transitioning to grade nine this year, so certainly can relate to what many are going through at this time. Um, we do want to talk about uh, mental health and wellness because that is such a key topic um, right now. And we really want, of course, this transition to be a positive experience for, for all kids. So before I kind of talk about what services we do um, provide in the district, I did want to start by just kind of defining what is mental health, because I do think that um, there's some confusion sometimes with our kids and ourselves around um, what's the difference between mental health um, and mental illness. So when we talk about mental health, we really are um, talking about something that's very similar to physical health. It's something that we all need. It is something that we need to nurture and invest in. Um, certainly when we talk about mental health, it is, a, it is that positive state uh, of well-being. Um, and it is defined as that balance between you know, physical, mental, spiritual, uh, emotional health. And it's not just about kind of thinking positive or being happy, it's really at the core about a sense of belonging, a sense of connection, a sense of purpose uh, to kind of help us through uh, the challenges that we, we may face. So certainly we want this for ourselves. And of course we want this for our children as well. When we talk about mental health problems, that's when we use terms like mental health issues, mental health challenges. There are various terms I think that we use to define that. And that is when it starts to seep into uh, our day-to-day -day functioning. So it kind of makes it difficult for us to cope. And we look at what are the symptoms and, and how frequent are they? How intense are they? How prolonged? How long are they lasting? And then if those are ongoing concerns, that's when we might get into diagnosable mental health disorders. Um, certainly we know the most common right now in both children and youth as well as in adults is anxiety and depression. And that can be caused by a number of factors including genetics as well as um, environmental factors as well. So when I talk about kind of mental health, I really talk about this dual continuum because again, I think that um, mental health is more than just the absence of mental illness. And I think that we always have to keep that in mind. Um, mental health changes over time, certainly. And so it is possible to have challenges with your mental health without having a mental illness. So for example, maybe our children are struggling with the stressors of school projects or assignments. Perhaps they've been through a breakup. There could be a number of things that may cause them to have challenges to their mental health. It doesn't necessarily mean that they have a, a mental illness. At the same time, the opposite is also true that they could have a mental illness and actually have very good mental health. So if you have a circle of support, if you have a wonderful system around you, then certainly you may be someone that has anxiety, but in terms of that day-to-day -day management, you are doing quite well in terms of your mental health. So why is this important though and why do we need to pay attention to it when it comes to schools well we know that achievement and well-being are inextricably linked you cannot separate them if someone is struggling with their mental health then certainly that is going to impact their focus their attention how they feel in school um, and that we know that schools can be really wonderful places to uh, notice early um, signs of mental health issues to provide ongoing support and also if we do those school-based early interventions, certainly there's research to show that um, it can reduce the experiences of more significant mental health problems later on in life for kids. So schools are kind of integral to kind of mental health and wellness. When we talk about mental health in terms of um, in schools, we use the aligned and integrated um, model for school mental health. And so this is really looking at what's the continuum of care that we can offer to students. And so we look at it in terms of tiered intervention. So that first tier is about those things that are good for all students. That sense of connection, that sense of belonging, that sense of community we know is good for all kids. 
We then have our tier two, which are really um, providing services to those kids that need a little bit more in terms of skill development, a little bit more in terms of support. And so that is for some students, they need that extra. And then finally, that there is the top tier, the tier three, and those are students that really require um, more intensive support. They're kids that are really struggling with um, mental health issues and really need kind of ongoing treatment and ongoing care. So that would be kind of at that tier three level. So, so again, much of our focus in, across the district is what do all students need? And really at the core of that, that is relationships. They need connections to caring adults. They need a place that they can feel included and they feel that they belong. And so this has been a huge focus across the district in ter terms of how do we set up those conditions for kids for both their learning as well as their mental health. We do know, however, that some students absolutely require more support. And so we are fortunate to have um, a psychology staff within the district. We have social work staff in the district. And we also have itinerant educational assistants that do that tier one and two, tier two mental health promotion um, and support. So at every high school, there is a psychology staff and a social worker that are assigned. They are there minimum one day a week. So in elementary school, they're there for about half a day a week, but in high school, they have a full day of support that they're offering. And they are typically really focused on kind of that tier three that I mentioned earlier. We also have the itinerant educational assistants. Again, they're doing that tier one and tier two support, and they're assigned to schools two days a week. And so that allows them really to do that mental health promotion work. And I'll talk in a, in a minute about some of the services that they are providing. For psychology and social work staff, they do spend a lot of time um, doing assessment, consultation, crisis intervention. We do have psychology staff that can do psychoeducational assessments. They also can look at private assessments and help um, educators to translate those recommendations into strategies and supports for students in the classroom. They spend a lot of time, our staff, on consulting with educators around how do we support students with the various mental health needs? Um, how do we support students that are exhibiting stress behavior in the classroom? How do we support learning difficulties? They also spend a lot of time doing crisis intervention. So certainly all of our staff are able to respond immediately, provide support, collaborate around safety planning when required, and really linking to our community supports as well and bridging that gap. Um, in terms of the approach that our, our staff use, our counseling uh, supports are uh, evidence-based. They are based in things like emotion-focused uh, support in um, collaborative problem solving is an approach that we use frequently, and then cognitive and behavioral approaches. Really, it is very much, though, about um, having a circle of care around students. So working with educators, working with administrators, working with guidance counselors, working with families, and also, again, working with those community supports as well. We also do have identity specific support. So certainly um, the OCDSB is really committed to uh, the success and belonging for all students and recognizes this historic and ongoing discrimination experienced by uh, certain communities. And so some students we know who identify as black, indigenous or part of the 2SLGBTQ plus community have really indicated a preference for receiving support from those who identify within the same community and have lived experience. And so we do have two social workers that are supporting black students and families. We have a social worker that supports indigenous students as well as a position for um, a social worker supporting the 2SLGBTQ plus community. Those services can be accessed through the school social work staff. And again, we have beyond our social work staff, we certainly have many equity coaches, um, graduation coaches, and many others that are also supporting uh, students in really important and meaningful ways. How do we access um, mental health services in the schools? So certainly as a parent or a student, they can go to their guidance counselor, their administrator, and we will hold multidisciplinary team meetings with our mental health staff where uh, we will discuss the needs of the student and pair the appropriate mental health professional with, uh, with the student based on those needs. In our district, students can self-refer as of 16. So as of the age of 16, they can uh, receive counseling services without parental consent, but under the age of 16, they do require parental consent. We also, our tenure and educational assistants are offering um, 
Wellness Matters. So it is a program that increases mental health literacy in all grade nine classes. And it really is focused on what are some coping strategies to help to manage the day to day, as well as what are some pathways to care. So really helping students to identify who are their support systems, who isn't within their circle of care within our schools and who can they reach out to. We are very fortunate to have many community partnerships. Um, we have Rita Wood counselors. So Rita Wood Addiction and Family Services is an agency and we have a Rita Wood counselor assigned to every um, high school. So you would be able to access services for your uh, child around uh, substance use and misuse as well. We also have mental health and addiction nurses that are linked to our schools and so, so many others. So we are very fortunate and really recognize the um, importance of, of community partnerships. I think as parents, it's really hard sometimes to have those conversations around mental health and wellness. So really, when we do uh, talk about this, we really encourage parents to kind of check in with your child. And I know when they're teenagers, they don't necessarily feel like they, they you know, you don't necessarily feel that they want to kind of have those conversations with you, but it is more important than ever just to kind of do those check-ins, share your observations. Hey, I've noticed you've been spending a lot of time in your room lately. What's up? Let's talk about this. I wonder, you know, if you're feeling increased stress because of this is what I've seen. So really kind of creating those spaces. I think as parents, often we, we listen to our kids, but we want to solve, we want to fix, um, you know, when they tell us things, but really creating that space for them to feel heard and supported um, and to share what their experiences are, especially as they make this transition to high school is, uh, is so important. And really, I just want to emphasize again that partnership between uh, school um, and parents is essential. I think that uh, we need to be in constant communication with one another. If you have any concerns whatsoever, please reach out to the school to share your concerns. Um, and absolutely, we will um, connect with uh, some of our mental health professionals or whatever is required. There are many resources in the community uh, to support right now. I'd really encourage you to kind of check out some of the resources. School Mental Health Ontario also has um, created some incredible resources for educators as well as parents. Um, and so I'd encourage you to check that out. And Mental Health Week is next week. So we will be sending out some information to parents around what are some uh, wellness practices that you can engage in with, uh, with your children um, in the coming week and, and moving forward. So I know that that was a really quick overview and, and recognize you'll be moving on to your next workshop soon. If there are any questions, please feel free to put them in the Q&A and uh, I will do my best to answer them. Thanks so much for joining me. I don't see any questions at this point. So again, if anybody has questions, please feel free. Otherwise, I know that uh, we were told the first workshop ends at 735. And so um, feel free to head over to your next workshop that you are um, signed in for, or as I said, um, and, and we have a question, wonderful. Is there any support offered for students with eating disorders? Yeah, so thanks for that question. So certainly we know that this is an area that has increased in the last while. Um, many of absolutely our, um, our mental health professionals are working with students at the school. What I would say is that we do not offer treatment in the school setting. So we will offer kind of bridging to community services. So recognizing that there are long wait times. I would also say that our mental health and addiction nurses certainly are important players when it comes to supporting students with eating disorders. So what I'd encourage you to do is to talk to your guidance counselor around your concerns for your child and we will kind of create a plan um, around who best to be connected um, and support with the transition and until they get connected to further services. Or even if they are already in, involved with community services, sometimes our social worker psychology staff can kind of bridge those, those connections and have communication with uh, those counselors with your permission so they can create um, a system of support at the school for, for your child. Thank you for the question. Okay, so if there are no other questions, um, 
you know, please, as I said, there's kind of your five minute break to kind of transition over to your next one. Um, and again, if there are anything that comes up, please reach out to your child's school, or we actually already uh, also have an email address, children's uh, mental health at ocdsv.ca, that you can email and access our leadership team as well if, with any questions. So I think it's just us moment. So I'm going to kind of go back. Um, and then I guess the next group will join us at 740 as I understand it. Welcome. I can see a few people are joining. I'm just going to uh, give it another minute for, um, for folks to, to pop in. Please know that there is a, there is a Q&A uh, box. So if you have questions, please don't hesitate to um, enter them into uh, that space. And I will do my best at the end to, um, to answer. Okay, I'll get started because 15 minutes goes very quickly. So um, it's like, you know, we're just kind of doling out information really quick. But again, um, please don't hesitate to put in questions in the in the question and answer box. And uh, I'll give you an email at the end of uh, this session if you have further questions you want to reach out about. So I'm Emily Bala. I am the mental health lead for the district. Um, and I'm excited to talk to you today about um, mental health and wellness and that transition to high school. I think that I, my guess is many of you and your children have uh, 
many different feelings happening right now as you, you uh, start to look at this transition. So whether it is excitement for some, I think, uh, nerves definitely for some, some ambivalence. Uh, I know that I also have a grade eight transitioning to grade nine. So I'm living that in my personal life as well. And so there are lots of feelings that are happening. And we want that transition to high school to be a really positive experience, obviously, for all students uh, and ensuring kind of their health and well-being is at the forefront is, is really imperative to that. So I wanted to start, though, by um, really defining when we talk about mental health, what is that? Because I do think that we use mental health and mental illness interchangeably often. And so um, certainly mental health is something that we all have, uh, similar to physical health, health uh, certainly. And I think that when we really talk about it, mental health is, is really that positive state of, of wellness, of flourishing. Um, it is something that we all want and need, but something that we also really need to nurture, we need to pay attention to. And I think we forget that sometimes. Sometimes it's not just about kind of being happy or thinking positively, all that, though that's wonderful, but it really is about finding a sense of purpose and belonging and meaning uh, is really, I think, at the core of, of what mental health is really all about. When we talk about kind of what are mental health problems then, uh, or mental health challenges, um, mental health issues, I think we use a lot of different language kind of to describe this. This is when we're really talking about when it starts to interfere in our day-to-day -day functioning. And so we do tend to look at um, what is the frequency of symptoms? What is the intensity of symptoms? How prolonged? So what's the duration of symptoms? And really then, if it really is interfering with that day-to-day, -day, then, then sometimes children, youth, adults can receive a diagnosis of uh, a mental health uh, illness uh, or mental illness, excuse me. And certainly we know the most common are um, anxiety and depression. And that can be for a lot of different reasons. Certainly uh, there's a genetic component. There also is an environmental component. Um, so those are all factors. I really like to think about it though, in terms of this dual continuum. And the reason is because I think that um, mental health is more than just the absence of mental illness. I think that uh, our mental health changes over time. I think the reality is that we can have poor mental health because we are struggling uh, after a breakup or after a, um, there's a lot of tests that our kids are struggling with. Maybe there's a lot of pressures around academics. And so it really can affect their mental health. It doesn't necessarily mean that they have a mental illness. The other is also true though. We, we could have a child or ourselves that have a mental diagnosed mental illness. However, our mental health is uh, we're doing well. We have a circle of support around us. We have a network of people. We engage in regular wellness practices and all of those things we know kind of contribute to uh, positive mental health. So why is this so important in schools, though? Well, we know that achievement and well-being are inextricably linked. We know that, you know, when you are not well, it is really hard to focus and stay in tune um, to studying and focusing in class. We also know that when we aren't doing well, achievement-wise, then that can really affect our well-being and our wellness. So schools are really ideal places to really focus on how do we do mental health promotion? How do we prevent? And then also, how do we access services? And within schools are great places to access services when we also need that intervention as well. So in schools, we really look at kind of the, the tiers of intervention. So we use the aligned and integration model um, for school mental health. So it looks at kind of the continuum of care that we offer around mental health services. So we know that at that tier one, these are services that are good for all students. And so we know that all students need to feel connected. We know that all students need a relationship. They need a sense of belonging. So that is important for all. We also know that there are some students that need a little bit more. They need a little bit more kind of skill development. They need a little bit more of a boost. And that is that kind of tier two when we're giving just that extra support. And then we also know at that tier three level at the top of that pyramid, there are students absolutely that have uh, diagnosable mental health problems. They need treatment, they need intervention, they need kind of those pathways to care. So we really work on that model and ensure that we are supporting all along the way. I already talked a little bit about kind of what all, all students need, but I think that that really is so important and it's something as a district we are really paying attention to because we know that when kids are well, then they will do better, right? And so that is so key. And so it, at the core of that is really about relationships. So building authentic, genuine relationships with caring adults in the building. 
So as I said, certainly there, there are kids that absolutely are going to need more and that's okay. And so that's why we are fortunate to have many wonderful mental health supports. So we do have psychology staff, we do have social work staff and itinerant educational assistants that kind of are the core of our, our mental health services. Um, psychology and social work staff are assigned one day a week to high schools at minimum. It depends. There are certain high schools that get more depending on the need, but um, generally it is one day a week for a psychology staff or a social worker to be there each. Uh, and then we have itinerant educational assistants that are on site two days a week. So the psychology and social work staff are, are typically working at kind of that tier three level that I was describing before. So again, those kids that really need that kind of extra in intervention and intensive support and our itinerant educational assistants are really working at that mental health promotion and prevention um, stages. So what do we offer? Our psychology staff certainly do do psychological assessments. So that is a piece of their work. However, it's really important to note that they do also do mental health um, support and counseling at the schools. Both psychology and social work do a lot of consultation with educators. They spend a lot of time talking to educators about how best to support kids, whether they're struggling with their mental health, whether there's some stress behavior that they're exhibiting in the classroom, whether they're having learning difficulties and uh, teachers need support around how to kind of accommodate and support those needs. Um, those are all pieces that our psychology and social work staff can help with. They do a lot of crisis intervention. And so certainly that responding immediately of being able to create safety plans and creating really smooth pathways to care in the community are a key piece to what our staff do. And they also do provide counseling. Now I would say we don't provide therapy, long-term therapy here in the school board, but certainly they are doing counseling and that is based on evidence-informed practice of cognitive and behavioral approaches, of emotion-focused school support approaches. So really validating and supporting kids' emotions and feelings. And then we also use a lot of collaborative problem solving. A huge piece of our work is also that bridging to community services. So whether it is we have permission from families to speak to professionals in the community that are working with students and helping to collaborate around how do we bring those strategies into the school to support students or really creating those pathways to hand off to the most appropriate service in the community. That is a huge piece of what we do. We are big believers in terms of the circle of care that the more people that work together, collaborating to support kids, then the better for all, all students. We also do have identity specific supports within our social work department. Uh, certainly we know that that is really important. We have heard loud and clear from some students who identify as black, indigenous, or part of the 2SLGBTQ plus community. They really have indicated a preference to receive uh, services and support by social workers who identify within that community and who have that lived experience. And so um, we really wanna make sure to honor that. So we do have social workers that work specifically with black students and families. Uh, we have a social worker that works specifically with Indigenous students and families, and then uh, we have a position for uh, a staff working with the 2SLGBTQ plus community. This is all accessed through the school social worker at the site. And again, certainly we also have many other incredible um, support systems of graduation coaches, coaches and equity leads and student success coaches and many others, again, that part, are part of that circle of care that I mentioned earlier. So how do you access mental health services in the board? Well, um, certainly accessing the guidance counselor, or the administrator to flag that there are concerns that you are looking for some support for your child is important. They will bring that forward to the multidisciplinary team um, and really will talk amongst one another about what would be the best um, support person to be um, kind of taking that next step forward. It is important to note as well that uh, at 16, students can self-refer. So uh, 16 and up, they can sign their own consent forms and can be seen by mental health professionals without parental consent. We also are doing the tier one, tier two um, uh, interventions that I talked about earlier. And one of those things are we are focused on delivering a program called Wellness Matters. Um, it is really focused on the grade nine students. We are trying to get into all the grade nine gym classes. And it really is about what are those coping strategies that can help? How do you identify stress? Uh, really talks about stigma related to mental health concerns and how do we kind of overcome that and then really talks about what are those pathways to care because what we've heard from students is you know sometimes they don't know who to go to and they don't know where that support is so we want to be really in, make sure that we're really intentional about um, letting them know how they can seek services when they need them. 
We are fortunate to have many, many community partnerships. We do have uh, Rita Wood Addiction and Family Services. So there is a worker assigned to each and every uh, school. So therefore, if you are concerned about uh, your child's substance use or misuse, then that is a wonderful link to be able to make, again, through, through guidance or through administration at the school. We also have mental health and addiction nurses that are working very closely with CHEO and with ourselves to kind of in ensure those smooth pathways between care and again many many other uh, supports and this is not even an exhaustive list of all the partnerships we have so it's something we're really proud of. I think that when we talk about mental health it can be really difficult to bring this up with our, our children especially as they are teen teenagers and we feel like they're kind of withdrawing from us somewhat. Um, we really encourage you to kind of check in with them just share your observation. Hey, I've noticed you've been spending more time in your room. I've noticed, you know, you haven't looked as, as happy as usual. Let's talk about it. I'm here, you know, starting to initiate those conversations around what you're noticing is really essential to opening up those lines of communication. I think it's also really important as, as adults, sometimes we want to fix and solve our children's problems, but really just being there to listen and hear is so essential in terms of um, having them come forward to us and, and trusting us to have those, those conversations. Really that partnership between home and school, I can't emphasize it enough though. Uh, we know that you know your children best and we wanna work in collaboration with you to support your children. So please uh, you know, let us know if you have any concerns, let us know if there's anything that you feel that your child needs and how we can best support. And we really wanna work with you in partnership around that. There are many wonderful resources that are available in the community. Um, I'd encourage you to look at the School Mental Health Ontario website. They have some wonderful resources as well and is, is absolutely what we use from a ministry standpoint to support um, mental health and wellness activities uh, with students. I also would ask that you kind of keep your eye out. Next week is Mental Health Week, so we certainly will be kind of posting some information around uh, wellness practices you can do with your children and different topics for each day of the week. So that is kind of provides you a very big, a quick overview of the services and supports we have. Certainly, I know you're gonna be transitioning very soon to your next workshop, but I welcome any questions you may have. Please feel free to put them in the chat box and I will do my best to answer them. Thanks so much for being here. If there are no questions, the only thing I would just also say is if you want to access the mental health leadership team, please feel free. We do have an email, um, childrensmentalhealth at ocdsb.ca. Uh, if you have questions you want to pose there, then certainly we welcome that as a method to access us as well. Thanks so much, everyone.
Welcome, I can see some people are arriving. I'm just gonna give it a little bit more time before I start just to make sure people have time to come in. Okay, I'll get started because 15 minutes goes by very quickly. So um, welcome everyone. My name is Emily Bala. I am the mental health lead for the district. I'm really happy to be here with you tonight talking about mental health and wellness and the transition to high school. Uh, I know that it is um, an exciting time for some, a nerve wracking time for some. I think some are feeling a lot of ambivalence about kind of what this is going to look like. I can say that I also have a, a grade eight uh, child moving into grade nine. So certainly I'm kind of living that as well and know all the, the, all the feelings that are coming with it. So um, certainly we want uh, high school to be a positive experience for uh, all the students coming in. And so ensuring that kind of their mental health and well-being is, um, is, is good and then positive and supported is, is needs to be at the forefront. So really happy to be talking about that. So before we start about what services we have available in high schools, I did want to just kind of start with an understanding of um, what is mental health, because I, I, I think we often use um, mental health and mental illness interchangeably. So uh, just so that we have an understanding and therefore we can support our, our children in an understanding of what is mental health. I mean, I think that I often talk to teenagers about mental health is something that everyone has, right? Um, I think that it is really positive mental health is that positive state of wellness and flourishing. Um, it is something that we all want and need, but also something that we really need to pay attention to and that we need to nurture and take care of just as we do our physical health. So we talk about mental health as kind of that balance between, you know, the mental, physical, spiritual, and emotional. Um, and that mental health is really not about just being happy. You know, I think that we often get caught. It's about positive thoughts, et cetera. It is maybe some of that, but really it relates to the sense of belonging, a sense of purpose, um, and then kind of an ability to kind of manage the things that come our way. When we talk about mental health problems, we're really talking about, um, when things really interfere with the day-to-day -day functioning. So it really interferes with our ability to cope. And so often we look at, are the symptoms that, that children or youth or adults experiencing, what is the frequency of those symptoms? What's the intensity? And what's the duration? How long is it lasting? And certainly sometimes based on those things, um, it can result in a diagnosis of a mental illness. We certainly know the most common our anxiety and depression. Um, and that is true both for um, students as well as adults as well right now. So often I talk about um, the dual continuum model. And so the reason being is because I think that we often think that, um, you know, mental health is more than the absence of mental illness. And so we know that mental health changes over time. So you can have poor mental health without having illness. So perhaps you are struggling because, uh, you know, maybe our kids have a lot of tests to write or a lot of assignments and that really affects their mental health. Perhaps we have a child who does actually have a mental illness, a diagnosed mental illness, but they actually have quite good mental health because they've found um, a way of coping, having a circle of support around them. Perhaps, perhaps they're engaging in wellness practices. So I think it's really important to, to understand that it is this kind of dual continuum that is kind of uh, helping us in, uh, in what is mental health and what is mental illness. So why is it important though to be looking at that in schools? Because we know that uh, well-being and achievement are inextricably linked, right? We can't separate those things, uh, absolutely. And we know that schools are really wonderful places to be able to promote mental health, for us to notice the signs early and offer services early. And we know from research that if we have school-based mental health interventions that are kind of designed universally and we do that mental health promotion, then we actually can support um, and prevent mental health problems uh, later on. So that's why it's so important for us to be doing some of this work in the schools. When we do um, support in, in schools, we look at it in terms of tiers. So we look, use the aligned and integrated uh, model for student um, 
mental health and well-being. And so we look at it in tiers. And so the first tier is really about what is good for all students. So this is something that we all need. We all need to be included. We all need to be connected. We all need to have relationships, right? Then there's the tier two. Um, and that is about what do students need that just need a little bit more. So it's good for some students. You know, they need that little bit extra skill development. They need that little bit extra coaching and support. And then at the top is really what do few, it's a fewer, a smaller number, but what do a few kids need? And so they really need kind of, they're the kids that have diagnosable mental health problems and they need intervention, they need support, and they need that bridging to uh, community services often as well. So kind of coming back to that first tier, this is something that we are talking about a lot as a district, right? We know that kids need to get a sense of belonging. They need to have caring adults in their life. They need to feel connected. And really the foundation of all of that is in relationships. And so that is so key. And certainly, as I said, something that we are talking about across the district, because that is a core element of what kids need in order to flourish and, and thrive. We do know, however, as I mentioned, that some kids need more. And so we do have, we're fortunate to have a, say, a psychology staff, social work staff, itinerant educational assistants who are kind of the, our core team that offer mental health services um, in the school board. So every high school will have a psychology and social work staff that will be there for a minimum of one day a week. It depends on the school, some have more, but on average, they will be there uh, one day a week. We also have itinerant educational assistants, and they typically are there two days a week. And so they would do kind of that tier one and tier two mental health promotion prevention work, while our psychology and social work staff tend to do that tier three work that I was referring to. So what does that entail? I mean, so our psychology staff certainly can do psychoeducational assessments, but it's also important to note that they do also do counseling support. So a lot of the time that is spent with our mental health staff is around consultation, spending time with educators around how best to address concerns related to individual students, whether it's to meet um, their mental health needs, whether it's to provide some accommodations and support, um, whether it's to support them because they're exhibiting stress behavior uh, in the classroom. So how best do we support around that? They also provide a lot of crisis intervention. So they will be there to see kids immediately if needed, to create safety plans, and again, bridge to community supports as needed. We do provide counseling. We do not provide therapy, but certainly we do provide counseling. And those are based on kind of evidence-informed uh, approaches which would include things like collaborative problem solving, emotion focused school support and cognitive and behavioral approaches to intervention. And then again, the big part too is that bridge to community resources. So we really believe in a circle of care. We really believe in collaboration, both with home, school and community. So working kind of together to create a com comprehensive um, circle of services for students we feel is, is really imperative. We also do uh, have identity specific support. Certainly we know that some students who are part of, um, who identify as black, indigenous and part of the 2SLGBTQ plus community really have indicated a preference for working with um, someone and um, receiving support from staff who identify within the same community that have lived experience. And we know that that allows um, them to kind of provide services to the unique needs of, of students within these communities. And so we do have those services available and they can be accessed through the social worker at the site. And we also, of course, have other, when we go back to that network of support, we also have graduation coaches and equity leads and student support workers. And so again, all working together to kind of best support student needs. So how do um, you access mental health services within the school board? Well, uh, we encourage students and parents to go to the guidance counselors, to administrators, and then they will bring that forward to the multidisciplinary team. Together with the team and the team of educators, as well as our multi-D teams, they will talk about what is the best uh, fit in terms of the needs of the student. It's also important to note that students as of the age of 16 can self-refer, so they can actually sign consent to be seen by a psychologist, a social worker, or itinerant educational assistant without parental permission. 
I'd mentioned earlier that our educational assistants are uh, doing work at that tier one and tier two level. And so they are really working hard to get out to all the grade nine gym classes to do a program called Wellness Matters. And that program is really focused on increasing mental health literacy for students. So really understanding uh, what a mental health is all about, what practices can help our mental health to really talk about stigma and what gets in the way sometimes about communicating around any mental health concerns. And again, looking at what are those pathways to care? So who are the people in their school that they can reach out to for support as needed? We are fortunate to have many community partnerships. This is not an exhaustive list by any stretch, but some that I would highlight is we do have Rideau Addiction and Family Services in our schools. And so certainly if you have concerns around your child's substance use or misuse, they're a wonderful resource. And again, can be accessed through your school guidance counselor or administrator. Um, we also have a close connection to the mental health and addiction nurses uh, that work with CHEO. And so they really help us to bridge services between CHEO and our schools. And what I would say is, you know, again, as you're entering into uh, those, the kids that are in those teenage years and they're starting to withdraw, and I think that can be hard to navigate sometimes as parents, um, just remembering to kind of check in with them uh, to really just kind of share any concerns you have and what you've noticed. Hey, I've noticed you've been spending more time in your bedroom. I've noticed, you know, you haven't been looking as happy. What's going on? Just wondering how you're doing. Creating space for those conversations um, is really, really important. I think that as parents, we hate to see our kids suffer. It is uh, obviously as a parent, you want to protect your kid from everything. And it's really hard to see when they are struggling. Um, and, and But remembering to kind of listen and create space uh, for them to talk without kind of jumping to fix is really essential, I think, in terms of keeping those lines of communication open with them. Certainly the partnership between home and school, I can't emphasize enough. We value so much your knowledge uh, and wisdom that you have. Uh, you are the person that knows your child best. So please communicate with us. Let us know any concerns that you have. We absolutely um, welcome those conversations on how best to support your child. There are many community resources uh, as well that we encourage you to check out. Uh, School Mental Health Ontario website is something that has a lot of resources for uh, educators as well as parents. And it's certainly something that we use frequently in terms of our mental health resources within our school board. And I also want to highlight that next week is Mental Health Week and we will be sending out information around wellness practices and some conversations you can have with your children. So we encourage you to kind of look for that as well. Um, I am noticing maybe there is a question in the chat, so I will um, move to the questions. Uh, oh, nothing yet. So if you do have any questions, please feel free to um, put something in the chat and I would kind of welcome that, uh, that discussion. I also want to note that the mental health leadership team does have an email address called children's mental health at ocdsb.ca. So please uh, feel free to email us if you have individual questions that you would like answered. Uh, again, we always welcome that or we encourage you to, to reach out to the school administrator to, uh, to talk about any further concerns you may have. So I will leave it open to questions now. I know you got uh, only about a minute or two before moving to your next workshop, but, uh, but please feel free if there's anything outstanding that I haven't covered. I don't see any questions. So I wish you the best of luck at your next workshop. And I hope the transition transition goes smoothly for, uh, for your children. Great question. Are there any wellness well-being clubs in schools? Thanks for that question. Um, yeah, you know what? A lot of the, the high schools have now started wellness uh, clubs and mental health clubs. And in fact, as a district, I just uh, have worked with some young people and we've just started our first youth action committee on mental health as a board at the district level. And so we're going to be really um, promoting that a lot in schools in the coming year. So uh, we're really looking forward to that work. They've also done some work around kind of mental health week, which is coming up. So they'll be sending out tips to all students um, 
in the in high schools uh, around kind of how to engage in wellness practices. So, uh, so it really what I'd say is it depends on the school in terms of whether they have a club going, but but that certainly is work that we are doing, and we're hoping that is going to be district wide within the coming uh, next year. So. Again, if any last questions, please feel free to enter them into the chat. And uh, otherwise, again, thanks for being here. see we've had someone join thanks so much for joining i'm just going to give folks time i think the next one starts at 8 20 so um we'll just give people time to join and then we'll get started
Okay, I'm just going to give about 30 seconds and then we'll get started. Okay, thanks everyone for joining. My name is Emily Bala. I am the mental health lead for the district and I'm really excited to be here talking to you tonight about uh, mental health and wellness. Obviously it is a huge passion of mine and something that I love to spend time talking about uh, in particular with, uh, with educators and, and with parents. So, so tonight we're really talking about that transition to high school and my guess is uh, many of you and your children have uh, a whole bunch of feelings associated with that. Maybe there is some excitement for some, perhaps some nerves around that transition, maybe some ambivalence and, and multiple feelings at once, which is what I always tell my kids. I also have a grade eight going into grade nine next year, so certainly um, I'm experiencing that in my home life as well and know, and know all the feelings that are coming with it. So certainly we want a high school to be a positive experience. And so centering kind of mental health and wellness, I think is really uh, essential in doing that. Before we start talking about the services, however, that we do provide around kind of mental health in high schools, I do want to just make sure that we have a kind of a common understanding of mental health itself, because I do think that um, there is a lot of confusion. I think sometimes we use uh, mental health and mental illness interchangeably. And so just to kind of make sure that we have a common understanding, because that allows us to also support our kids in, in an understanding of what mental health is. So, um, so often, you know, I talk to kids about mental health is really about you know, positive mental health is that positive state of wellness, of flourishing. It is something that mental health is something we all need um, and we all want, but it's also something we need to pay attention to and we need to nurture and we need to take care of. So similar to our physical health. So mental health is really about that balance um, of the mental, physical, spiritual, and emotional. And so it's not really just about being happy. It is, um, and thinking positive, it also relates to uh, our sense of belonging, our sense of purpose, uh, and then our ability to kind of manage things that come our way. When we talk about mental health problems, uh, we talk about mental health challenges, then really those are kind of terms that we use when we're having difficulty um, managing, div difficulty coping and functioning uh, with the feelings that are kind of coming our way. And so when we look at that, we look at the, the frequency of symptoms that people are having. We look at the duration that symptoms are laughing, la lasting. And then we also look at the intensity of the symptoms. And so sometimes when we have really intense, we have it um, lasting a long time, we have it happening really frequently and really interfering in our day to day functioning, then sometimes it can lead to a diagnosis of a mental illness. We do know that the most common mental illnesses right now are anxiety and depression, and that is both in teenagers and adults as well. So I often talk about kind of the, the dual um, continuum model. And so Again, this is about that mental health is more than uh, the absence of mental illness. And I think that that's really important to say. And also that mental health changes over time. So you can have poor mental health without having illness. So for example, perhaps your child is very stressed about a many upcoming assignments. Perhaps um, someone's experienced a, a breakdown, isolation from friends that really a lot of kids have been experiencing in this last while. Um, you know, these are things that are uncomfortable emotions and challenging for some in terms of the stressors they're facing, but not necessarily uh, kind of a mental illness. At the same time, someone could have a mental illness and also have positive mental health. So they may actually have a diagnosed mental illness, but be, you know, have coping strategies that they're really using, have wellness practices that they're engaging in, having a circle of support around them. So in fact, that their actual mental health is quite good. So I think that that is really important in terms of how we understand mental health. Why is it so important to be talking about this in schools? Well, we know that achievement and well-being are inextricably linked. We can't kind of separate those two things, right? Schools are ideal places for us to promote mental health, for us to notice um, early signs when, when kids are struggling to offer services and provide ongoing support um, when needed. 
So we know that research shows us that if we do kind of school-based mental health interventions early and delivered universally, that we actually can uh, prevent mental health problems later on for kids. So when we talk about kind of mental health services, we really work in the schools around uh, thinking in tiers. So we actually use the align and integration model for school mental health and well-being. So we think in tiers, and that's really about kind of the continuum of services that we provide. So there is the tier one services, and those are good for all kids. Right. So that's, you know, ensuring that kids feel understood, that they felt they feel included, that we're partnering with them. That is good for all kids. Then we're looking at kind of that tier two level. So it, tier two is really those services that are good for some kids. Some kids need a little bit extra. They need a little bit more skill building. They need a little bit more coaching to kind of manage the day to day. And then there's tier three. So tier three, of course, being at the top of the pyramid is really about those few students who have diagnosable mental health concerns um, who really need kind of treatment and ongoing care. So, so certainly that first tier, as I talked about, that all kids need is at the core, right? And we talk about this a lot as a district. So really that connection to caring adults, that sense of belonging and feeling included, um, that, you know, people noticing when they're struggling and reaching out and engaging in those conversations. And that's really, again, those core, genuine, authentic relationships with caring adults is really at the core of what all kids need. And again, we've been focusing on that so much as a district uh, to ensure that we have that for all kids. We do though, again, we're really fortunate to have mental health support. So as I said, there are gonna be kids that are gonna need a little bit more. And so we do have psychology and social work and itinerant educational assistance. They kind of form the core group of those that are providing mental health services in our district. Um, at each high school, there will be a psychology staff, a social work staff that will be at the school one day a week. Uh, sometimes more depending on the high school, but in general, one day a week is the assignment. And then we will have an itinerant educational assistant who does more of the tier one and tier two supports that is there two days a week to do that kind of mental health promotion um, work. So what our staff are providing? So we are looking at like the psychology staff, of course, would, would be able to provide some psychoeducational assessments. They would be able to review a private assessments that had been done and really look at how do we take those recommendations and really put them into strategies and interventions in the classroom. But really it goes beyond the psychoeducational assessments that really that counseling is a key role for school psychologists and social workers in our district. Um, when they do counseling, they are using evidence-informed approaches to counseling. So really we tend to use a lot of collaborative problem solving. We use a lot of emotion-focused school support. So really validating and hearing kids' stories and supporting them in that. And then we use um, cognitive and behavioral approaches to support as well. Our mental health staff do a lot of crisis intervention as well. So they do a lot of immediate response for kids, a lot of safety planning and really bridging them to community services as required. They also spend a lot of time with educators consulting around how best to support students uh, who have mental health needs, how best to support students who are experiencing stress behavior and exhibiting stress behavior in the classroom um, and really providing a lot of parent consultation of, uh, as well around, you know, what are, how do we better best understand your child and how can we work together to, uh, to support them at school and home. And finally, they do a lot of interagency collaboration. So that bridging to community resources. So whether it is linking students to services in the community or perhaps students already have services in the community and being that uh, liaison between let's say a private counselor um, and the school staff to help to bring in those strategies to support kids in our buildings are all really important. We believe deeply in providing a circle of care around students. So having everyone working together collaboratively to support students needs. We also do have identity specific supports. Certainly we know that some students who identify as black indigenous and part of the 2SLGBTQ plus community um, have indicated a preference for um, support from those that are within their community that have lived experience. And so really um, that has been um, important for us to be able to provide. So we do have social workers who work with black students and families, indigenous students and families, and part of, again, that 2SLGBTQ plus um, 
community. And so those can be accessed through the school social work uh, staff um, at their site. And certainly it goes beyond that. We also have incredible graduation coaches and equity coaches and many others coming back to the importance of that circle of care that we need to provide for all kids. So how do uh, students access this support? And so um, certainly going to your guidance counselor, administrator, um, trusted adult in the building to say, you know, that they kind of need that extra support. Students can have those conversations individually uh, or parents can reach out directly. We do need parental consent up to the age of 15. Once kids turn 16, they can sign their own consent for services, for counseling services. But prior to that, we do need parental consent. And so when those, um, those kids are brought forward, whether it's themselves or by parents, then they, the school staff bring it to the multidisciplinary team. And we have a, a conversation around who would be the best fit to support the students' needs. And so really, I think that that's a really essential piece around that dialogue to make sure that we are pairing with the right person and to provide the right services at the right time for kids. As indicated before, our itinerant educational assistants also are doing some really incredible work. And so they are doing a, a program, delivering a program called Wellness Matters, and they are targeting all grade nine gym classes in all of the high schools. And so what Wellness Matters is, it's a program that really looks at mental health literacy. So helping kids to understand what mental health is all about, how do we take care of our mental health, talking about coping strategies, talking about the stigma uh, and so how can we break down that and be more willing to talk about uh, mental health concerns that we may have, and then being really clear with kids around what are the pathways to care so who, who are those identified people within their school that they can reach out to um, for help if they need it. We are really fortunate in the district to have many community partnerships, and this is certainly not an exhaustive list by any stretch. We do have Rita Wood counselors, so Rita Wood Addiction and Family Services are in all of our high schools and provide um, counseling support. So if you have any concerns around your child's substance use or misuse, then they can be a wonderful support. We also help have mental health and addiction nurses that uh, help to create bridges between CHEO services um, and our school support. And as I said, so many, so many others uh, that we have, we really do believe in, again, that, um, that collaboration with, with community partners as well. I think that uh, in terms of kind of as a parent, I know it can be really difficult to speak to your child about any mental health concerns. I think especially as they are teenagers and withdrawing from us, I think that that is something we need to be really uh, mindful of is how do we continue to kind of create space for dialogue with them. And so certainly we encourage you to to check in, um, to create space for those conversations, to share your observations. Hey, I've noticed you've been in your room a little bit more than usual. What's up? You know, I'm here if you want to talk. And really trying as parents not to, to solve and fix problems. I know even as a parent myself, it's really hard to see your kids struggling and you want to solve it for them. But what certainly we've all learned, I think, or certainly I have, is, is just creating that space to listen and be present is essential, I think, to uh, continuing open dialogue with them. I really come back to partnership is key. We value uh, kind of what you bring to the table, the knowledge and wisdom you have, you know your child best. So please reach out um, and share any concerns you may have so we can work uh, in partnership to support your child um, as they're moving through high school. There are many community resources uh, that are just wonderful that I encourage you to explore. I'll highlight School Mental Health Ontario. They are the ministry um, directives around kind of uh, oversee mental health services and, and uh, supports that we offer. Uh, and so there's some great resources that you can find no, not only for educators, but parents as well on, on their website. We are going to be having Mental Health Week next week. So also look for um, some messaging that will come forward around um, some themes and dialogues. Uh, the teenagers themselves will also be receiving emails around this, around some wellness practices. And so um, may create some opening and conversations that you can have um, with your children. So I know that that was very quick. 15 minutes is never enough, I think, to talk about all of this. Um, if you have any questions at all, please put them in the chat box. Uh, we also do have an email. The mental health leadership team has an email at childrensmentalhealth at ocdsb.ca. So childrensmentalhealth, all one word, at ocdsb.ca. So if you have any particular questions, don't hesitate to email us. 
Um, or like I said, before you leave today, uh, don't hesitate to put any questions in the chat box. Thank you so much for coming and being here with us. And uh, for those of you that are leaving, then have a wonderful evening.